Yo, welcome back to the show. This is the Pulse on the Joy News Channel on Monty TV. Now we're about to talk about the National Democratic Congress. It has been, what, almost two weeks since the polls closed and the, uh, and the announcement was made. The verdict is that the MPP won the election and the NDC lost, to put it simply. But the inquest has already begun within the NDC, trying to understand what's accounted for the loss and what is the plan moving forward. Joining us in the studio today to help us understand within the ranks of the youth and their crusade for poverty and accountability, what they are looking at and what their own diagnosis of their loss in this election is. Dr. Chris Jokito is the convener for the crusade for poverty and accountability, a think tank within the NDC, calling on all national executives of the party to step aside. Why is that? Details now. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having okay. me here. I've never heard of the group. Where did it come from? A group of like-minded people who decided to come together and fight the cause of probity and accountability in the country. Mm. Most of us are aligned, or all of us are aligned, to the NDC to the because NDC. definitely, I mean, if the the ideals and the image of the NDC from the beginning was all about probity, accountability, and social justice, that is what embodies the founder, President Jerry Rawlings, and that is what the NDC has been known for. Mm. Is this a brand new group, or it's been around for a long time? It's a brand new group. Uh, created when? Yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Was it created out of the fact that you lost the election? I think so. It contributed to that, um, to the formation of the group, the mm. fact that we lost the e election. I mean, it's something that we've always been pondering over, um, uh, the image of the, of the party, how we think probity and accountability should be um, further enhanced within the party, but we th definitely the election result had facilitated the formation of the group as well. Okay, so before the creation of the group, what were your concerns about the image of the NDC that needed sorting out? Basically, what had been reported in the media, especially to do the, with the elections, you, you, you could hear people com complaining that well, uh, the, the the posturing, the body language of uh, of the of the party might not appeal to a certain class of voters, the Which bourgeoisie, class? bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. uh, the middle class, the identity of the party uh, to the grassroots was um, uh, actually waning. I mean, th these were some of the concerns or some of the things that the um, the, the, the group was thinking about, I mean, like minds, informal discussions, but we decided to formalize it and then, I mean, properly articulate our content within the party. So yesterday we had our, our, our meeting uh, press conference and with probity saying and accountability, definitely you'd have to begin from your own self before you go out. We are going to examine all the issues one after the other. We're going to look at uh, policies, events, processes, decisions, taking um, uh, issues uh, to do with uh, the perception of corruption within the party. All those things will definitely be looked at in an objective manner by, by, okay. by the group. Now, once you mention probity and accountability, the first thing that comes to mind is the founder of your party, Jerry John Rawlings. True. He's the embodiment. Is that it, and he is the embodiment. Some look at your group and say, are you coming out of his shadows? We would be privileged to be coming out of his shadows. But are you? We are not. But we'll be privileged because that is what he has stood for and, and, and fought for all his life. And I think that his, um, let me say, his standards for probity and accountability are so high if you are able to meet it, it will be good for this country. We know that within the NDC, we've seen this trend before, groups created. I can easily point to Fonka game in the past. Which corner are you coming out from? I'm coming out of an objective corner. Which corner is that? Objective corner. Who's standing in your corner? Who's the, who's the big man standing in your corner? Uh, we are big men of our own. I mean, the grassroots, they own the party. Mm. They own the party. The power belongs to them. 
So we, we believe that every single individual who believes in probity and accountability mm. is a big man of his own. Then together, when you put our efforts together, that is when the group reflects what it reflects onto this country and how it's supposed to be run. There, there, are, there, are, there are some who look at this and say, you are only talking out of sour graves and pain, and that's why you've created this group. Is that what it is? Not at all. I'll tell you why. It's purely an objective trajectory that we are on. Uh, because even within the group, I'll take myself as an example. I'm a party uh, official. I managed a constituency this past mm. election. And the first issues that we raised has got to do with the outcome of the election. I can't take myself out. If I'm asking for provisional accountability, that means my head is on the chopping block as well. But come at the hour, come at the, so the, the solution. Okay. Is the former President Rawlings the one sending you to do this, sending your group to do this, to go after the leadership of the NDC and say they have failed your party? That is an emphatic no, N-O. He's not the one sending us. I mean, these, these are people who share in the ideals he stands for. That is the point of intersection. And so what do you seek to achieve here? Clear out the hierarchy of the NDC, and then what? Oh, definitely. We are not looking at clearing out anybody. You're asking them to resign, all the, all the top executives. We are the asking hall. them to step aside in order uh, that an inquest is carried out. What's their crime for, for them to step aside? What's their crime? Look at the result of the election. We are not saying they've committed any crime yet, but they had a mandate to prosecute, and that is to win the election. This is a crisis situation. Why do I say so? In 2012, President Mahama won by plus 300,000 votes. In 2016, he lost by minus 1 million votes. That's a whooping one. That's a net gap of one, almost 1 1.4 mm. million. This is a crisis situation. We have to find out why it happened this way. We don't have time. So we are just asking that they step aside. An inquest is carried out. We are not saying that they are guilty. Maybe it could have been a certain government appointee. Maybe it could have been me as a party official in, in, in Keta. It could have been anybody else. But if we do not diagnose our problem now, 2020, 2016 might just repeat itself. Okay, but it's been just, what, two weeks since the results were declared. Will it not rather be a time for introspection? Each member of the NDC sitting to think it through and understand what happened. And then you can, you can begin to look at the leadership and ask questions. Is this not coming too early in the day? It's coming too late in the day. Too late. In other jurisdictions, even before results are declared, people are already even resigning. They do that for a, for a reason. And this is 14 days or 15 days after the election. It's definitely too late. There has to be a direction. When you are in crisis, there has to be a straight, clear, cut direction that everybody will follow. You know why there's a breakout of blame games within the party? It is because direction has not been seen. I mean, how are we handling the defeat post-election post, um, um, post 2016? The best corner to assess this will be history. In 2000, when the NDC lost the election, did people resign? How did they lose? Second round defeat? So if that, it was that, a second round, there, there will have been no need for an inquest? If in a game of football, let's say Hearts of Oak and Kotoko. Sorry always, to cut you, but the stakes are different. Politics and football, no, totally relax. different. You'll see the similarities I'm talking about. Mm. If they always play a, a game of football, and they, it, it's, it's always a very close contest, 1-1, one, 2-1, one, one, you could say hard luck. But when it's 10-0, you don't think it's a crisis. It's some, I mean, something drastic would have to be done. I mean, something definitely went wrong. And those are the things that we think the party should go into and, and actually unearth it so that um, uh, solutions can also be uh, given towards the redemption or the recovery, as uh, some might want to put it. We are not saying that the national executives are the cause of it. No. 
neither are we saying it's the, it's the, it's the government appointees. I mean, we've seen symptoms of things that could have led to this uh, defeat. And we, can, we, think, we, think, we think it's only an inquest that will be able to tell us exactly what it what was. Are, what, are, what are some of the symptoms you saw? We, we said people should not indulge in blame game. And in fact, our party chairman, I gather, had also uh, given a press conference and had said that he doesn't want the issue of blame game. And we are also asking people to stop the blame game. But all we are doing is to offer a proposal as to how the inquest should be carried out. It's for the good of the party, for the good of the national executives as well. Because if a neutral body carries out this inquest, definitely the acceptability is going to be very high. It won't, there will be no perception mm. of massaging the outcome of the inquest. So they can pen it out to the Council of Elders that, that we are stepping aside because of this so that an inquest can be carried out. Everybody is, 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 is going to be under the microscope. Is it, I mean, certain policy uh, initiatives or implementations? Is it because of the perception of um, the corruption is because party officials didn't do their work well at the regional level or at the national level? Were there any specific indiv individuals within the party that cost us? Was it the way we were communicating? Were we getting the points across to the Ghanaian people well? Were we cutting away uh, a, a, spe a specific voter population in the country by the way we conducted our first? Okay, you've asked for an inquest. You're saying the leaders should step aside. Who do the inquest? The Council of Elders, definitely if there's any conflict situation as such in the party, mm. they advise. And I'm sure the Council of Elders can decide to put together seasoned people who are on the sidelines, not necessarily the day-to-day -day management of the party and the campaign. I mean, people like Al Haji, Hudu uh, Yaya, His Excellency Victor uh, Beho. I'm sure, I mean, a lot more. The NDC abounds in talent. The um, two names you mentioned are those of the old guard from the Rolling Sarah. So, again, I need to ask is this not coming from the corner of the former president? Well, usually, um, Council of Elders, elders will definitely come from the, I mean, 92. Re regime or I mean from the PNDC regime because I mean they've been in the party for a very long time they've seen it all from the beginning um, to where we are currently so definitely there will be old people but if they're I'm sure I mean those are names that readily came up I mean not that I am trying to suggest any name for the Council of Elders I know they are able and capable of choosing people who can uh, actually carry out those kinds, uh, this kind of work. Is this an inquest you want to see, or it's a process to hang the albatross on the neck of someone? And I ask that question because just yesterday, at the time we were making this announcement for the inquest, the Functional Executive Committee of the NDC had just met the leader, President John Mahama, at his house. I was not aware so of that. So timing is important. You say you do not know, but I'm sure as a member of the party, you will be aware of this. That uh, fake met. Th that fake met the president. Met, met, the, met the president yesterday. I, I, do, I don't know they met. I don't know the agenda for that particular meeting, but I don't know how I, how it influences what we did. I mean, we have put a, across a proposition that is to be considered, and I'm sure if it convinces the majority of the grassroots, it's something mm. that they would be um, a, able to. I mean, push through. I mean, I mean to the. Um, national executives to the Council of Elders. If they do, why not? So at the end of the inquest, what does your group, the Crusade for Poverty and, and Accountability, want to see at the end of the day? No, we cannot preempt what we want to see. What we want done is for accountability to be ensured. That's short term. Medium and long term, it would mean that every party officer who is, is, who is was given a role to play either in mm. government or within party would know that, I mean, the, the party members are wide awake and they would demand for accountability at a point in time. Okay. Mr. Jokoto, uh, we'll just have to pause for just a moment. We'll go for a quick break. When we'll come back, we, we will continue and begin to understand 
what, in their view, their initial thoughts are about what has just happened, the NDC losing the, the 2016 elections. Details after the break. Stay with us. You're still watching The Pulse on the Joy News Channel on Malta TV. Let's now head uh, to our universities and tertiary institutions. It looks like there's this issue that's coming up that they want closure on very quickly. It's the issue of truancy. Yes, you heard right. Truancy. You thought it was only for basic school and uh, secondary schools. No, it's also happening at the tertiary level. And that's what uh, the National Union of Ghana students are seeking to rectify with the bill that will deal with this. Let's get more details now from uh, Julian Kobna. He's the president of News, joining us in the studio. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for having me here. Now, what's the truancy bill about? You see, what um, other states do, other countries do, that to be able to... If you could speak up a bit for me. ...be able to prevent the number of people that do not go to school, especially at the basic level, to at the university level, is that they, pa they use the legislative apparatus available to pass uh, laws that prevent people from doing that, and that when these laws are passed, it becomes much more punitive for any parent that does not allow his children to be in school. I'll give you an example. If you go to Cape Coast, Central Region, for instance, there are very good schools in Cape Coast. And you see that primary standard people should be in school. These are students that are, 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 are fishing. They are uh, uh, seashore. They're not going to school. If you go to um, the north, sometimes at 12 o'clock, they are instead of going to school. People are not in schools. So you go to the voting region, people are not in school. It's because we have given the discretionary powers. Please of, speak up a bit for me. It's, it's, have, it's quite difficult here. It's because you have given the discretionary powers of people attending schools to the to the largest of parents, and we must stop that. And that, I think that that's why we have to be able to use the incentives of laws to make it much more punitive for any parent that doesn't take a child to school. So in 1992, we passed a, a new constitution. We said that. In the country, that in 10 years from 1992, we must make education much more compulsory, must be free. We fail to use the, the legal mechanisms to make sure that these things are, 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 are achieved. So, this, a lot of years after 1992, we have a constitution that doesn't attend to that. Our laws don't make education much more compulsory. So, if I, I stay in, say, for instance, Bali Bamboy, I don't want to take my child to school, what is the country's response to that? Nothing. There's no response to that. So, we have, if we want to improve this country's uh, development process, we have to be able to build more and more innovation. Okay, so for this transit bill, Who's creating it? This is what we want to do. We want to test the law. You see, the, the law says that if you don't have a, uh, if you want to pass a law in parliament and it, it comes with a financial obligation, it, it, cannot, it cannot pass. But it does mean that, that's, it means that when a law does not come with a financial obligation, the law must pass. We want to be able to sponsor a research organization. We are crafting that bill, give it to a parliamentarian when the parliament sits uh, for the same for January and see if we can test the law and make sure that we can have a private member. So at bill. what stage are you now? Have you, have you drafted this we, law? We, are sponsored, we have we spoken to um, um, experts in drafting and we have spoken to the Ted Network led by Dr. Yahweh Graham to do intensive research about that. We are, we are, we are trying to get, uh, um, uh, I'm sure you know, um, uh, 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 Sangudele uh, organization and start to, to see if we can put a lot of pool of ideas on how to make this bill come into, into pass. That's what we are doing now. We're trying to make sure that the students' union stands on its feet to respond to the number of people that are left out of school because we are not able to use legislation to answer to that. If we do that, we create the two-way affairs. When the law compels students to be in school, it means that we are also going to demand from our central government the amenities that, that man, the social responsibility that might be available to make sure that people go to school. So if I stay in a village, if I stay in Karaga, and I must go to school and the schools are not available, I'm, I'll demand from the central government to make sure that the schools are available. Okay. That's how we can pull to, to make sure that this country really works. Because you have to get everybody in the bus. If you want to get everybody in the bus, so everybody must be educated. That's, That's right. the best way to do that. Okay, let's see, let's see how that bill goes. But briefly, uh, there is a new administration coming in 7 January. Yeah. For NUCS as a body, what's your own expectation? What do you want to see? So this is what we want to do. Um, I also speak to about something we spoke about today. We want to, we expect that the new, uh, the new administration answers to them of people that kept, that defer their programs in the university every year. So if I, if I have seven years and I want to read medicine in, in tech, I don't have any money to pay. I, I have to respond by the student loan trust fund. But uh, unfortunately for... Yeah, it's quite difficult hearing. If, I have, if I have seven A's, for instance, and I get admission to, to, to tech to read medicine, and I don't have money, I can't go to school. What we want to do is make sure that SLTF provides the, the funds to them on, um, um, available in September so that you don't have to wait till March to, to pay your fees. So if you do that, we can be able to make sure that pop, more people go to school be, uh, financed by the student loan trust fund so that we can be able to keep the number of bad debts that happen now because people okay. do. And we also want to see something. See, there's another perception out there that, that uh, we want um, a, a government 
that uses the stimuli of, uh, of, of, uh, of venture capitalism to, to generate innovations out of young people so that we can start more private uh, uh, enterprises so that we can be able to keep unemployment. Okay. Uh, we also addressed another issue in our press conference today is that there's this uh, idea out there. I think that um, some people who have got uh, interest in, in the government that's going to be considered as engineer want to take the student union forever. We have got information that they want to break into our secretariat. Uh, and, uh, okay, but so for that, you don't have the evidence, do you? No, we have... Um, you say intel, but what is the yeah, evidence for that I'll, intel? I'll give you, so, um, we, had a, we had a program at, at TV3. Somebody came there and then assaulted the news officers. And the process of, of assaulting the news officers, the police arrested the person. For us, just wake up in the morning, uh, the following morning, and the deputy for Ghana, the MPP, had issued a press conference ratifying the impost of a, of a news president as a news president. And this one is okay. you know, going to respond right. to that. We want that to correct. Let's see how that is done. We are telling okay. the, the MPPs, youth organizers, and, and staff to stay off the course of the situation. Right. Okay. Thank Julian, you thank you so much for your time. Julian Coburn is the president for the National Union of Ghana uh, Ghanaian Students. We'll go for a quick break. And when we come back, there's still more Christmas. We'll check out traffic and shopping. Plus, I have a special guest for you today. You don't want to miss this. Stay with us.